What a great blessing. I really appreciate this man. I've heard him minister many times, and I consider him to be a great mentor and even has mentored into my life. He's got a wonderful church, and there's longevity in his life. I just love being around pastors that have got longevity. Uh, you know, some stay in a ministry for two, three, maybe five years. But my goodness, this man has just served the Lord so faithfully since 1984 in Koinonia Church there in Bloomingdale. And it's a great church doing a wonderful work, uh, which helps all of us to inspire to even greater greatness because it's good to have men of example uh, that lead by example and not only lead by example but with humility. So many of you were blessed last night by his ministry. Let's welcome St Pastor Steve Fleming as he comes to share a game with us today. God bless you, Pastor Steve. of Christ. I love the fact that God makes us all different and unique and personality and style and uh, pulls us all together and causes the love of Christ to walk as one, to be as one. I want to start by reading a passage in the message translation. Paul's writing 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Companions, as we're in this work with you, we beg you, please don't squander one bit of this marvelous life that God has given us. God reminds us, I heard your call in the nick of time. The day you needed me, I was there to help. Well, now is the right time to listen. The day to be helped. Don't put it off. Don't frustrate God's work by showing up late, throwing a question mark over everything we're doing. Our work as God's servants gets validated or not in the details. People are watching us as we stay at our post. Alertedly, unswervingly, in hard times, tough times, bad times, when we're beaten up, jailed, and mobbed, working hard, working late, working without eating, with pure heart, clear head, steady hand, in gentleness, holiness, and honest love, when we're telling the truth and when God's showing his power, when we're doing our best setting things right, when we're praised, and when we're blamed, slandered and honored, true to our word, though disgusted. Ignored by the world, but recognized by God. Technically alive, though rumored to be dead. Beaten within an inch of our lives, but refusing to die. Immersed in tears, yet always filled with deep joy. Living on handouts, yet enriching many. Having nothing, having it all. Dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide, open, spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. These words um, jumped off the page to me as I read them, and the challenge to all of us is to live big lives, not small lives. If it is God's grace, and it's God's grace that Paul is talking about here, if it's going to be by God's grace, then we need not live small lives unless we're going to live them on our own. God wants us to, to dream big and to go with big dreams and to live big lives, but depend upon him and lean on him. Dr. Lester Sumrall made a comment about champions. He said, champions are rare. They're a rare breed. They trust God while others are asking for answers. They step forward while everyone else prays for volunteers, and they see beyond the dangers, the risks, the obstacles, and the hardships. Well, sometimes we don't always feel like that. Sometimes it doesn't, we don't always look like that. Sometimes we don't always respond like that. And seasons of life, I love that comment that Brian made when he said that uh, with the change of seasons come a change of sound. So when God is changing a season, the sounds change, and I was facing a change of season uh, in the fall, and that brought about some of my uh, desperation with God. And a moment of desperation, early morning prayer, I wasn't leading, but one of the men that were leading, my, my desperate cry for God says, God, you got to do something big because I can't see far enough. I trust God with my future, but I didn't see the future. I couldn't see what he had. I, uh, my faith was not reaching to that. And in just a moment after, for months, you're looking like I've been 
looking through clouded glasses and foggy and couldn't see far enough, and that's not a good thing when you're supposed to be the leader. If you're leading your company and you can't see where the future is, that's a problem. You know, if you're leading the church and you can't see where the future is, that's a problem. If you're leading your family and you can't see where the future is, that's a problem. But in just a moment, I heard the Spirit of God whisper to me, if you have fresh faith, you'll have fresh fire. If you have fresh fire, there'll be fresh fruit. And in just that moment, I got set free. Within minutes, really, I was talking to my pastor on the phone. He says, what happened to you? Because he could tell it was in my voice. It was different. You know, we don't always feel like champions, but that's what God call, has called us to be. We've got the champion living inside of us. We need this fresh fire. And fire talks about uh, the symbol of God's presence, of his power. Uh, it was the fire for protection or destruction, like the pillar of fire that protected the exodus or the fire that refines us. In the same way, we have to check our faith. Fresh faith knows that God will take care of us no matter what we face. And the faith of Christ is what feeds the fire of the Lord. We need to check our fire and our spiritual passion, our zeal and our intensity. They don't, op don't evaporate. Satan is out to steal the, the hot embers in our soul. Uh, those things that would relight and rekindle the fire. Those of you who are campers, those of you who like to go to the cottage, you like your campfires. I love a campfire. And you can go out in the morning and you can get out of the campfire and it looks dead. Put your hand over it. There's a little bit of heat there, but not much. But if you get down there and you stir those embers up a little bit and you add a little bit of wind to it, you, you can get that glow to, to burst into flames and that fire can burn again, and sometimes that's what our soul is like. It's just warm. It's just embers. And the enemy wants to steal those embers so they can't burst into flame. But, you know, just a, a gust of the wind of the Spirit can cause flames to, to ignite again and our hearts to burn with passion. It was that passion in John chapter 2 that the disciples saw when they were looking at Jesus. Jesus, after the Passover, the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And many, when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. So a different look at Jesus than, than what I grew up uh, seeing on the wall of the church. Little, I, I saw Jesus this kind of like angelic, Kind of guy and way too pale. And uh, so I went with a little sheep, you know, and it just looked too tranquil. And, you know, shepherds, you know, we think, we think soft and easy, but shepherds were the toughest guys around. Uh, they, were, they stood up all night guarding their sheep against wild animals. These were, these were uh, tough guys. But um, he said to those who sold the doves, take these things away. Don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. Now, I just kind of read that, but I want you to see the picture. Jesus comes in, and he is livid. And he begins to beat these guys and chase them out of there and turn the tables over. And he's hollering and yelling, and they're watching this, and the disciples are going, whoa, we haven't seen this side of Jesus. But then they remember out of Psalm 69, 9, the words of David, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Zeal is passion. It's spiritual fire. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. And I have to ask myself here in Canada whether we are more consumed or consumer. Are we consumed with the fire, God, or are we just consumers? Because we are, are, are tempted on every side to simply consume and feed me, feed me, and do it for me. And what can you, what do you got for me today? In, in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is speaking to the church and he's speaking about marriages. I don't know how many of you guys are, are married, but I know that when I talk to young people and I ask a group of young people how many like to be married, almost every hand in the room will go up. In spite of the ones that have been uh, affected by divorce in their families, in spite of what they see as imperfection around us, there's no perfect marriage, marriages, but we want to celebrate good marriages. We want to celebrate those who are working hard at their marriages. But most young people have a, have a dream and a desire to marry, not realizing the work that will be in store for them or the hard work or the, 
amount of dying that needs to take place. Robert Morris uh, wrote a book with his wife, Deb, uh, called uh, The Blessed Marriage, and there was a quote in there that just, just rocked me. I, saw, I never thought about it that way. He said, the problem with why marriage counseling doesn't work is, is because you're dealing with people that aren't dead yet. And that's exactly true. If I was a dead man, I wouldn't react how I do sometimes. If I'd really been crucified with Christ and got what Paul was talking about, I wouldn't respond how I do at times. You know, in, in marriage, verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, and he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You know, I don't know how many of you are married, but uh, you can understand that this passage is talking to us about uh, the church and Jesus. And uh, we're, we're supposed to represent Jesus in a marriage, uh, husbands, and our, our wives, the church. And uh, Pastor Jack uh, Hayford made a comment one day to a bunch of ministers, and he said, uh, he said, I don't really think that's fair, because we all know that Jesus loved the church perfectly, and we all know that the church doesn't love Jesus perfectly, and yet Jesus died for the church and will still lay his life down. So I, I don't like that, but when I get an opportunity to talk to a bunch of men, I, I like to remind us that we do are, are the ones that set the course for our for our families. We do have the opportunity to, to love our wives and to set before them an example of the love of Jesus. But I tell you this, uh, you've already discovered, as I have, that it's impossible to do in our own strength. It, it ought to bring us to a place of, of desperation. But you know what we need in our marriage? We all need passion in our marriage. It's not enough for me to say, well, you know, June 12th, you know, 1976, uh, I married you. That meant I loved you. So uh, just don't forget that. And, and I really meant it. We, we laugh, we joke about that, but you know, here's, here's a little closer to home, but 20 years ago, I was going through a situation, actually, where was it, 25th, no, it was less than that, uh, 13 years ago, we were having a rough year in our marriage, we were 25 years married, I thought it was going to be an awesome year, it was, a, it was our year from hell in marriage, and um, so, you know, I was working my way through, my pastor and a spiritual dad, the two of them were working on me and helping me, and I never would have made it through without them. In fact, I wouldn't be pastoring today without them. And, uh, you know, so I made this statement to Beth one night. We were talking, and I shared with her my, my unconditional commitment to her as a, as a husband and this real good spiel. And she was upset in the first place. She got mad. She got madder. And she went upstairs, and I got madder. I'm thinking, that is like crazy, because I know a bunch of women in our church that would love to have their husband make that kind of commitment to them, and this doesn't make any sense at all to me. So passion not correctly directed gets incorrectly directed, but fortunately, I got on the phone, and I went to call one of my spiritual dads out in British Columbia, and I thought, you know, when he, his, you know he's gonna, he travels all the time, so he's not going to be home, so when his answer machine picks up, I'm going to give him earful. The uh, only problem was he answered the phone. <laughs> and as he answered the phone, I just took a breath and said, oh, well, here it goes. He knows me and he loves me and cares for me, so I'm just going to give him the deal. So I just dump, 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 dump. And, and he, every once in a while, he'd interject, you don't really mean that. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> you, know, you don't really mean that. Yes, I do. And I told him the story was going on, and he just started to laugh. I said, I'm glad you're enjoying my pain, Dwayne. And I said, okay, so uh, you seem to be know what I'm talking about here. He, oh, he, I said, why are you laughing? He says, well, because I've been there before. <laughs> I said, okay, well, then help me because I, I don't get this. And he said, he said, Steve, she didn't hear an ounce of romance in what you said. He said, you just made that sound like a life sentence, not like a deep desire. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Are you kidding me? No, he said, if you said it how you said it to me. Yeah, I said, just like that. Then there was no romance in there. That's not how she heard it. He's already tried that on Marva. It didn't work. 
I suggest you retry. I did retry with considerably different results. Because that's not what I was trying to communicate. I communicated commitment, but without the passion. The passion and fire in marriage doesn't just happen. It takes time together and enjoyment and being around and connecting and talking and communicating, experiencing life together, enjoying life together. But he's really talking about the mystery of Christ in the church. So how can we be passive about what Jesus is passionate about? That's the church. Church isn't a building. We can meet anywhere, and we do. Church is about people. And church is about an ever-growing, increasing family of people. People on your street and on mine that don't know Jesus Christ yet. But, you know, when we look at what God's called us to do, Jesus said that the first commandment, Mark records it in chapter 12, verse 29. Jesus answered this man who was reasoning. He says, which is the first commandment of all? They're really trying to trick Jesus. But he says, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, which you didn't ask for, the second is like unto this, or really close to this, directly related to this one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. The test of first love is for us to ask ourselves, is there anything that consistently is in first place before God? We're to be a worshiping body of people, uh, posturing ourselves before God, but it's our heart, our heart that directs our life. Whatever has our heart runs our life. What's our greatest passion? We have lots of passions. Do you know I can go by on a Sunday morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, and there's guys in the river fishing already. I'm sure it's like that around here. I don't know if they get, have a problem getting to work on time, but they don't have a problem getting fishing on time. You know, you can always tell what our passions are because we're tired until you talk about our passion, and all of a sudden, new energy surges through us. My wife and I were going to see a new couple at the church uh, many years ago. And uh, we were just going to visit them, and as we were heading up the stairs, we had talked about this on the way out. We had to drive about a half hour out of the, city, out of the town to this uh, small village where this couple had come with their family. And we were, we were talking about, we could have been busy, we were tired, neither of us really felt like going. We were just doing because we'd committed to go, and, you know, nobody made us have to go in the first place, but we were just tired, and, you know, when the time comes, you're kind of going, why did I say Yes. One of those kind of things. And so we started going up the stairs, and they had this apartment with a long, long stairway. We got to the top. But, you know, they started asking us about the vision of the church when we got upstairs. All of a sudden, we lit right up. And uh, we were there for several hours, and we kind of floated home. We both looked at each other and said, that was awesome. <laughs> What a great night. We could have stayed home and napped all night and never felt that good. Because it was about something that ignites our deepest passion. Pastor John Osteen used to tell all the senior pastors, he said, you ought to go on a mission field somewhere at least once a year to keep your global vision and your passion alive for souls. And so I've tried to do that. It's helped a lot of times. I come back realizing we are blessed. We are fortunate. People that think we got it tough in Canada have not traveled enough. Some of you lived in other lands. That you know what, uh, what it's really like. You've traveled a lot. You have family in different parts of the country. You have a lot to teach us who were born here in Canada and have taken a lot of things for granted. But it's the same for church. We can take a lot of things for granted that others have provided ahead of us, before us. John wrote a letter to the churches in Revelations. There's a ch letters to seven churches. You know, and when I was taught this back when I was a teenager, people got way off track and they forgot about the Great Commission and living for Jesus and hot and heavy. They're all worried about when Jesus is going to come back, so much so that we forgot what we were here for to do. But you know, this Revelation is really a book for the church today. You know, it's speaking to the issues of the day. It's not a out there, far out book, really. Revelations chapter 2, there's seven churches. And I just want to remind us about a couple 
for a moment, because I think they're the biggest ones we face, the issues we face in North America. And uh, this first church is the loveless church. Revelations 2.4. It says, you, you know, I know your works and your labor and your patience and that you cannot bear those who are evil and you've tested those who say they're apostles and are not and have found them liars and you persevered and have patience and labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. That's, that's awesome. You're doing great. Nevertheless, I got this one thing against you. You've lost your first love. The loveless church is, a, is an issue for us. We forget what God has done for us. We forget what we already have. Do, do you remember, right now I'm just going to ask you, do you remember significant moments in God that you've had? Maybe it was a, maybe it was a time when you were a kid at camp. Maybe it was that, that altar call on that day, you remember. See, there's significant moments in our life that we need to remember, and if we have a hard time remembering, we ought to write them down so we don't forget. There's many of those in our life. They're meant to be. My most recent would be December 17, 2013. I won't forget it the rest of my life because it's when God refired me for the next season. It's when he speaks to us. You know, when were those times? Where were they? Who were you with? What was happening? What was God touching in your heart? And is that still fresh for you? we got to ask ourselves, is he still our first love, or has he been crowded out? We were in Hawaii uh, on vacation, my wife and I, just uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, we were whale watching one on Monday afternoon, and we had the opportunity to see a competitive pod, and we'd never seen this before, and they say it doesn't happen very often that they're there when it happens. And a competitive pod is a, there's about 11 males that were competing for the attention of one female. And, you know, and actually the whales don't, Respond a whole lot different than we do sometimes as guys. And so they're all following the female, and they're all kind of jockeying for position, and they're pushing others down and pushing them out of the way. And so whales, you know, they can hold their breath usually for an hour at a time, and it's no big deal. So usually you don't see them, but for 45 minutes we followed this competitive pod through the water as they just kept coming up because they got to keep coming up for breath because they're working hard, trying to impress and pushing each other down in the water and up out of the way. And they're just kind of going like this the whole time. And that's, that's kind of how we are sometimes. You know, we, we get in this thing and we push around and prod around and we get off of our focus out of life. There's a lot of things that are competing for our attention in life. But we have one first love. You know, the second church is a persecuted church, and in Canada, we don't know a whole lot about that. Our persecutions are pretty minor compared to most of our brothers and sisters in the world. There's the, then there's the compromising church, and certainly that's an issue for us at times when we compromise on the principles uh, that are in scriptures. There's the corrupt church, which is the fourth church, and the fifth is the, the dead church, which we all know to be the dead church, and the sixth is the faithful church, and that's, that's a good one, but I think the other one we have a problem with in North America sometimes is this lukewarm church. That's number seven, church number seven, the lukewarm church. Now, that's the tendency all of us have, to settle back down, to settle into our, our little rut, or some say settle into our grave. Our grave is just a big rut, somebody said one time. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17, the problem here. Laodicean church, these things says, the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, on or off, saved or not saved. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. It's not a good picture. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. I don't think there's anything that touches North America closer than that picture in that letter to the church at Laodicea. You know, we become rich and full and wealthy, and it's not just talking about finances. Self-sufficient, wise in our own eyes, I can do this. You know, what brought me to my moment on December 17th was complete desperation. If I don't see it, I can't do it, if I can't do it, I'm done. 
No, I says, good, now I can talk to you. <laughs> I'm thinking, man, should have done that earlier. I guess I wasn't desperate enough when I thought I was desperate. But I got desperate. See, we always have to need God. We always need, need God. I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. It's not just a song. We actually, the, the more competent we become, the more we have to work at realizing our need. I remember standing in the pulpit one day and being amazed that God could take me, a man of such weakness, of not natural training, and God could use me very deliberately in a university city to prove a point that it was him and not me. But I remember the day going, wow, I can actually do this now, and it scared the daylights out of me. That I could actually go through the motion and do what I do, and most people wouldn't know the difference, that the anointing was God was on me or not. It scared me. A lot of scares. It's just healthy need and unhealthy need. Unhealthy need is the addictions and the uh, dependent relationships that people have. There's all kinds of unhealthy needs, but there's good healthy needs that help us realize that for me to be the husband my wife deserves, I need God's help. For me to be the dad that my, my kids deserve, uh, I need God's help. For me to be the pastor that I need to be and that, God, uh, that people deserve, I need God's help. Paul in Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He identified the fact that they did have need. He, he prayed to people and he said, uh, you know, you didn't help me in my need. This church helped me in my need, but you didn't. I didn't take anything from you when I was in need. And Paul talks about being in need. See, see God's always wanting to do things in your life and in my life, but we have to realize and require us to need him. And sometimes we have trained ourselves that we can do all things. But the scripture says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Uh, Jim Cimbala, you know, once the Lord spoke to me, I went, geez, Jim Cimbala wrote a couple of books, great books. <laughs> Maybe. He said this, God's attracted to weakness. Our weakness actually makes room for his power. Our weakness actually makes room for his power. And I was reading this morning Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Three times I pleaded with the Lord that it might depart from me. And he said to me, this is the words of the Lord, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is enough for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. That was a word that of the Lord to Paul, that he got a revelation on. That, that wasn't somebody reading the scripture to him or uh, it's just reading the scripture. This was Paul who heard it in the first person and the Lord spoke from heaven and said, my strength is sufficient for you. My power is made strong and perfect in weakness. Paul had a revelation of that's how he could say most gladly now, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'm going to boast in my infirmities so the power of Christ. This is not so that he's going to roll over and play dead. This is so the power of Christ can overcome him and overwhelm the situation. Therefore, I take pleasure. I'm not there yet. Are you there? Yet I'm not quite there. I take pleasure, he says, in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. But this is what he knew. This is why I journaled on this morning. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. That doesn't mean I'm weak physically. It doesn't mean that I'm small in stature or weak in mind. It doesn't mean that. It means when I am at the end of my rope and I don't have the ability in my own self, then I need God to be God in my life and fresh faith is what feeds the fire. But we have to give priority to intimacy in our relationship with Jesus Christ in the same way we give 
feed our passion with our wives. Intimacy doesn't just happen. Close friends aren't close friends because you never see them. It's because we make time for each other. Neither does it happen with God. we got to build it and make those times together. And that gets crowded out. And for those of you who think we got all kinds of times to do that in the ministry, that's one of the biggest challenges for any pastor is to block off times. And I totally turned my week around. I now do my study on a Monday. I don't go into the office. I stay home. It's not a day off. It's never been my day off. I figured if I took a Monday off, I'd waste the day because you're kind of zonked after Sunday. But I find, I'm finding this is a good thing for me personally. I, I stay home. I don't answer my phone. I don't want to know a problem in the church, and there's like umpteen of them. I don't want to know about them. Don't anybody talk to me all day long on a Monday, and I'm, and I'm 80% done my study for the week on a Monday. Because I'm not, my head's not clear yet. I go in Tuesday, Wednesday, and it's full of meetings. I used to take Thursday as a study day and Friday off. And Thursday, I could hardly think. It'd take me hours to get all the stuff out of my head. This question, that question, this meeting, that meeting, this emergency, this person's over here, this staff member needs help with this one over here. And I, by Thursday, man, I, I'm looking like a deer in headlights. So this, this is working for me. So like my wife says, your, your schedule is your schedule. You can change whatever you want, so just figure out what works for you. And so we're trying this, and it seems to be working. Because we have all kinds of things that can crowd that time out, just like you do. Whatever your schedules are at. Some of you, you know, most of us don't have just 9 to 5, 40-hour week. At least they say that, 9 to 5, but that doesn't mean that. And then some of you got the commutes on top of that. I'm going, hats off to you. So the time gets crowded out with God, our intimacy with him, but it starts to show. It starts to show in all of us. It's got to be nurtured on a daily basis, and we have to celebrate regularly, corporately. It's our personal times with God and then our corporate times that stir and encourage and strengthen one another. We get amongst each other as brothers, and we just can celebrate and rejoice and lift one another. We demonstrate our priorities as we live our lives out in front of our kids. We live out our Christianity through the principles that we live by and the decisions we make and the priorities that we set in our life through our conversations and our prayer and our reading habits and our commitment to building long-term relationships. But the priority of our corporate life, we demonstrate that church is not an option, and far too many have demonstrated to their kids that church is an option. So the kids has an option, then uh, I don't think I want to bother. It's a command. And a necessity to assemble together. We'll never make it unless we assemble together. Our strength out there happens as we gather together here. It's with the Lord and with one another. And then we go out and we come back weeping and rejoicing with each other. Sin of independence in North America deceives us into thinking that our corporal expression of Christianity is optional and our own discretion and depends on I heard a pastor in the, in, the, in the South one time. He had a lot of problems with people heading the cottage every, every weekend. And he says, that was the craziest thing. He, they, he said, well, pastor, we're gone for like two months, three months, whatever it is, and we'll see you later. And he says, okay, well, if you get sick, you just call the marina guy down there. He'll be your pastor for the summer. <laughs> don't, don't call us. You know, call your pastor down at the marina. <laughs> He said things changed, you know, when they started reaching out to the community kids and they got a bunch of those guys to buy buses so they could bus kids in on the Saturday. But once they had something in the game, they didn't want to go to the cottage quite so often. They wanted to see what was going on with those buses and with those kids. And some of those guys changed their life because they changed their focus. We've got to ask ourselves, how hungry are we for God? That's what we were talking about this morning here. How hungry are we for God, for his word, for his presence, for his power? Are we quick to pray? Are we quick to share our faith? Quick to give? Quick to allow God to use us? Or are we a little slow on the draw? It's an indication. That's all it is. Just an indication. Some of us tend to be a little quicker, a little slower on certain things. But you know you, and when you're slower than normal, it's an indication. It's an indication for me when I get cynical. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not super positive, but I'm not usually super negative. I'm kind of a guy this, like this in the middle a bit more. My wife will tell you she, 
I tend to go to the negative side, but that's more about me. But, you know, we get into this place and we ask ourselves, you know, how am I, am I okay or not? And when I get a little cynical, I know that's a little indication. You better watch that. You're, you're slipping. And back in September, I said to my wife, I tried being nice. It's not working so hot. So maybe I'd be a mean old coot. Maybe that'll work just as well. It would be easier anyways. Yeah, I thought well, I a, it sounded even dumber when I said it. You know, I was thinking it, and it didn't sound very smart, but when I said it, it sounded even stupid. But when God gives you a fresh word, and you could be reading your Bible, and God can speak a fresh word from an old verse you, know, you thought you knew. Because he knows our seasons. He knows what's going on. He knows our questionings in our heart, and he's not intimidated, as Brian said. He's not intimidated by our questions. But hey, our hearts have to be open and desperate to hear what God is saying to us as he speaks that fresh word of faith and begins that fresh fire and we get our anointing and our prophetic edge back. See, words like fire. Jeremiah the prophet said this, chapter 20, verse 9. God says, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding back and I could not. Love that, passionate, right? You know, so strong, I, I tried to hold it back and I could not hold it back. What God said. Jeremiah 23, 29, he says, And he who has my word, this is the Lord speaking, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord? The, the fire of God will burn up the chaff from our life. And by chapter 33, Jeremiah in verse 3 says, Call to me. And I will answer you, the Lord says, and show you great mighty things which you do not know. You got anything you don't know today? Because I got a few things on my list. Call on me in desperation. And I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. I think God's always going to have stuff on his side of the balance sheet that he knows that we don't know, but we need to know. And he just wants to know, Steve, are you desperate? Do you really want to know? Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says it's the, the letter that kills, but the Spirit gives life. Christianity is not just a, a teaching religion. Doctrine alone does not transform people. It takes the power of God. You can have right doctrine and still be dead. In John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, Jesus is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. And they knew the Scriptures and didn't recognize the living word right in front of them. What a shame that they knew the scriptures but didn't recognize the word of God, the word of truth as he stood in front of them. Because it is the word and the spirit that bring life. I heard it said many years ago, it said, if you have only the word, you dry up. If you have only the spirit, you blow up. And if you have both, you grow up. We need both, all of us. We need both to grow up. God will manifest his presence in direct proportion to our passion for him. Our heart change must take place, and that only happens with the Word and the Spirit. It's a heart transformation only God can do. It's not just changing for a moment. We, we've all made a decision, and we kept it for a little while. People do it every year at New Year's, New Year's resolution. Usually, it's about, this is what I'm going to try to do this year, which means I'm not going to do it very long. <laughs> This is what I'm going to try to do this year. We're not talking about that. We're talking about I can't transform myself. You can't transform yourself. God, that's God's work, and he wants to do that in you and I, and he can transform us. And others really change us totally from the inside out. And he keeps working on us, and the more we allow him to work on us, the more he changes us. The most godly people I know are the people that have a lot to be proud of, but they're not. They're the ones that know God the most, but recognize there's more that they don't know than what they do know. I want to learn to live my life realizing that the more that I know, the more that it reveals that there is more that I don't know of this God that I serve. I have a fire and a hunger 
to see people saved. I'm tired of the arguments. I'm tired of the excuses. I'm tired of the arguments of doctrine. I'm tired of that. I just want to see people transformed by the power of God and go from darkness into light. Another quote from Pastor Jim Cimbala. He says, Satan's main strategy with God's people has always been to whisper. Don't call. Don't ask. Don't depend on God to do great things. You'll get along fine if you just rely on your own cleverness and energy. The truth of the matter is that the devil is not terribly frightened of our human endeavors and credentials, but he knows his kingdom will be damaged when we lift up our hearts to God. He is the Lord of the breakthrough, but how badly do we want breakthrough? That becomes the question. Well, I think I'd like it. I'd be interested. I think I might like breakthrough. It won't happen. Breakthrough happens when we're out of our own resources and we are understanding our need and admitting our need and crying out to God that it's up to you. If you don't do it, it can't be done. John the Baptist in Matthew 3.11 says, He who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that purifies us permanently in Christ and refines us. It was at a prayer meeting, Acts chapter 2, verse 3, where the Spirit of the Lord fell upon them and there appeared to them divided tongues of fire. It was this experience that so transformed Peter. Peter who was prone to action. Peter who I can identify with tends to put his body into gear before the brain gets engaged. Tends to open his mouth before he has time to think about what he's going to say. But this same Peter is now full of fire and passion in chapter 2. And he stands up and he begins to declare the gospel and preaches his first main sermon. And 3,000 people are saved that day. It was not because Peter was an amazing orator. It's because Peter had been transformed by the power of God. And the power of the Lord was at work within him. And as he poured out that, it came out and impacted other people. The fire of God, the passion of God, the zeal of God in us always has people on the other side of it. The big thing for us is not just will we change for us, but will we change for those who are going to hear us? Will we change for those who we are going to meet? You haven't even met them yet, but they're depending that there's someone, a man of God is going to show up in their life. And that's not just in the mission in Africa or South, Af- or South America or Asia. That's in the mission of downtown Brampton, Kitchener, Waterloo. It's true. Because people are people. People need Jesus. They need the life that we have I want you to look at, around you right now. Don't, I don't want you to comment on this, but just look around just to, real quick and realize um, God doesn't use any perfect people. None of us are perfect. That's not the criteria for his call upon your life. We, we tend to look at where we miss it rather, rather than where we've gotten some things right. It starts right with our hearts wanting to serve God and saying, God, I don't know if you can use me, but here I am. He loves those prayers because he says, oh, yes, I can use that. He loves to pour this this power of Christ out upon those who will recognize their weakness. We see the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers upon the early church. And it says, the fear of the Lord came upon every soul. And many signs and wonders were done through the hands of the apostles. This early church was a passionate community of people. It was so fresh and so new, they hadn't yet got familiar with it all and used to it all. I'm a church kid. I never grew up thinking, someday all of this will be mine. Never. I thought, oh, I I love junior church because I got out of the real church. And I thought, boy, when we were pastoring, I thought, boy, I never want that to happen. Well, sometimes we still raise up church-wise kids. We still raise up people sometimes that got used to it. It just was always here. The Lord spoke to me one time and said, it's the hardest for our kids, the further they are from your moment of transformation. When you really got set, the biggest change in your life, if your kids saw that, 
That's one of the best things to help direct them in the right way. But for many of us, it happened when we were younger, and then our kids came along, and they never saw that greatest thing. They just knew mom and dad, you know, had this love and loved Jesus, and that's what they knew, and they grew up loving Jesus, but they never had a significant moment where God touched their life. They got to have their own experience with God. got to have their own experience with God. Every one of us has got to have our own experience with God. It's not enough to hear about somebody else's story. That can encourage us, but it's not enough. This, this early group of people called the church were passionate in community. They were passionate, in their, passionate and radical in their giving. It was like, are you kidding me? Selling properties, bringing the money in here. Anybody needs help? Here it is, here. I mean, it's radical. They are passionate about this. They met daily. Every day they got together. It changed everything. Passionate worship? Absolutely. By chapter 3, the book of Acts, Peter and John acted with great boldness. It was a hallmark of fire. Boldness. They preached with this fire in them. I think fire comes with revelation. It's a key point. When God speaks that word to you, it puts fire in your belly. It's now a word of the Lord. It's not just a set of words. It's a word of the Lord that you grab a hold of that your family's going to be saved. God's visiting your workplace. Life's going to be different. I got to touch on your life and you're going to be used in ways you never thought of before. When God speaks that to you, it puts a fire in the inside of you and you say, I don't know how, don't know when, don't know how that's going to happen. But somehow, some way, God will do what God does. And as they were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 4, they preached the gospel. And the word that they preached was what Jesus had been pouring into them for years. They prayed with such boldness that their fire within them caused them to act with boldness because passion will produce boldness. I actually had somebody leave my church one time because they said, I asked them why, which I know people hardly ever tell you the real reason why they leave your life, but um, they said it was because I was too confident in what God had called me to do. And I thought that was one of the stupidest things I ever heard. I said, you mean you would follow me as a pastor if I didn't know where I was going? And I thought, you know, half the time I don't know where I'm going, but the other half I do. So I don't know. Until God speaks, I have no clue. I'm just, we're just going the right direction. But when God speaks, yeah, you bet I'm bold. But I'm not bold until God speaks. That's me. I know people, they're bold all the time. That's not, that's not me. But when God speaks to me and here God spoke to me, then I'm bold and there's no hesitation and my passion rises to the surface. And that's who I am. But I think God wants to speak to every one of us. And if you hear one thing this weekend, whatever it is, write it down. The reason you write something down is because we won't remember even the thing God spoke to us, chances are. Figure it out later which was the most powerful thing, but if there's a statement that somebody makes, there's a word that rings off the page at you, and you go, whoa, whoa, that, you might have been the only one that heard that word because it was for you. Write it down. Write it down. Sometimes it's not even exactly what somebody spoke and said. It's what the Holy Spirit is saying. And I learned over the years that what's more important than what I say is what the Holy Spirit says while I am speaking. We're just setting the table up for you, for the Holy Spirit to speak a word to you. Because that's what changes your life. Not this word, but the word the Holy Spirit affirms in your heart. Could be a same word, but it could be a totally different word. You know, fresh fire speaks about fresh and filling. Marilyn Hickey said years ago, we need... To be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit because we constantly leak. You know, you can, <laughs> you can, we, can we can define that different ways, but I think we get that, that life uh, causes fullness to leak out unless we are through intimacy continually seeking God and being refilled. That's what fresh faith is about. I don't want just old testimonies. I want there to be fresh testimonies in my life, fresh faith. 
fresh fire, and fresh fruit in our lives of what only God could do. And we give him praise. Father, we thank you today that as we look to you, you're the greater one. You live and dwell inside of us, and that is amazing. Father, you came to reveal yourself to us and to change us and to enable us to do what we could never do in our own strength. Father, may today each one of us have a fresh revelation of Christ in us, our hope of glory. Fresh revelation of your word to us that speaks to us, Father, of your heart and your desire and your dream to use us for your glory. Father, we thank you for this time that we've been able to pull apart. Thank you that you are desiring to get your word to us and a fresh word in us. Father, I pray for each of the men that are here right now today in this place. Father, you know every situation of life they come from, those who are living life on their own and those who are in families, those who are separated from families, those that are in a good spot, those who are in a desperate spot. Those who are in the dangerous spot of being life's okay, life's good. The danger of familiarity. Father, we face all kinds of seasons in our life. We're so tempted, Father, to put other things before you and to lose our first love. And we're so tempted, Father, to be neither hot nor cold, just mediocre, just okay. Father, we ask you right now, we set our hearts to seek you. We set our hearts to love you with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. We ask you to relight that fire in our heart. that burns, Father, we cannot contain. I ask you to do that work in the heart of each man right now, Father, by your Spirit. We breathe on the embers, Father, of the fire. Lord, we see it glow, bursting into flames. Let it burn bright and hot. Oh, we bless you. We bless your name, O oh Lord. Just worship him for a moment. Just speak to the Lord. Just use your own words. Just admit our need to him and ask him to come and fill and equip us for what he's called each one of us to do. Lord, we bless your name, oh God. We worship you. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. We worship you, oh God. Mm. Blessed be your name. We bless you, Lord. Lord, please light the fire, the passion in our soul, a refreshing from your spirit, quickening. We bless you. Well, there is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. If you know it, sing with me. 
Lord, there is none like you. No one, no one else can touch my heart like you do. I can search for all eternity, search for all eternity long, and find there is none like you. Oh, there is none like you. Lord, there's none like you. And no one else can touch my heart like you do. Well, I can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Mercy flows. Oh, mercy flows like a river wide. And healing, and healing comes from His hand, comes from His hand. Suffering children, suffering children are safe in His hand, safe in your arms. There is none, because there is none like you. Sing it now. Oh, there is none like you. No, there's none like you, Lord. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I can search, well, I can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. I can search. And I could search for all eternity long And find there is none like you We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Praise God. Brothers, if you could be just seated for a moment. We're about to break for lunch. Have a great time of fellowship. And as you break for lunch, I just want to encourage you. I know it's human nature to hang around with the guys that we know and hang around with our churches, our tribes, uh, where we're comfortable. But, you know, one of the reasons that we put this all together, the four churches came together. Uh, was so that we would understand that there are other members of the body in other churches. And even as the organizing committee came together, I, I just met some great men that, that put everything that you're experiencing and enjoying together. And so I really want to encourage you that you'll break away just from the, the people you know, the, the comfort zones that you know. People have name tags. Uh, get to know them. Ask them uh, where they're from. And I just want to mention once again, this is not a one-time conference. This is literally a movement. Uh, we've set up a Facebook page, a website. We're going to be doing uh, smaller uh, meetings, and then Pastor Randy's going to give you next year's date. This is something we want to continue on and have even other churches join us. But right now, what I'd like us to do is, I'd like us to receive an offering for our, our speakers, for Pastor Steve, for Pastor Brian Warren. We just want to uh, bless them before we, before we go to lunch. I want to read to you a scripture that Pastor Steve mentioned while he was uh, speaking. Wasn't that a great word, by the way? Wasn't that just, wow. Wow. <laughs> I got, you know, Lord, if I say something wrong here, forgive me. But I, I want to tell you, you know, the scripture says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know? And, and I'm not a particular fan of Bell Canada. I've always wondered, can anything good come out of Bell Canada? I've had some rough experiences, but evidently, praise God, it can with Pastor Steve Fleming. And, uh, <laughs> I thought to myself, where, where do you learn to sing like that, Lord? Like climbing up those poles? He's like singing away to Jesus? I don't know. Anyway. But in uh, Philippians 4.19, he says this. Paul says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But brothers, here's what I want you to understand. You know that word supply? One of, one of the Greek thoughts that it brings out is the word to finish. So let's read it this way. And my God will finish 
My God will finish every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, usually, you know, we come to a part of the service like this, and, and if you're a $20 man or you're a $50 man or a $100 man, you know, you just kind of like flippantly go with, well, you know, I'm a $20 man. Boom, there's your 20 bucks. Move on. But what I'm hoping we're going to do this afternoon is actually listen to the Spirit of God. And if God asks you to put in $20, don't put in 50 if God asks you to put in 50, don't put in 100. If God asks you to put 100, don't put in 75. But here's what I want us to do. I want you to see it against your need. Don't just flippantly tip God and say, okay, here's 20 bucks. I want us to see it against our need. How many have a financial need? You have a financial need today. Listen, as men, fathers, heads of homes, we carry the pressure and the stress. But I love what God said here. He's going to finish your need. How many would like their need to be finished today? And you know, Paul said this to only one church, people that partnered with him, and we want you to partner with us so that we can bless our speakers, uh, take care of the expenses. I want you to know that uh, the four pastors came together, and we just, we just put this thing on together by faith, and we said, if there is a shortfall, then the churches would cover it. I don't believe there will be, but this is our heart. Uh, we believe in this. We believe God has brought us together for such a, a time as this. And so, uh, I, I, you know, I love also what Pastor Steve said about sometimes we live small. Let, let me just tell you, I, I've been working with a business person in the church, in our church, and uh, just trusting God for some things. And all of a sudden, this person came in, and, uh, you know, God does some amazing things. The person came in and said, Pastor, God came through, and God blessed me with an island. An island. I'm like, wow. <laughs> and uh, the person said to me, Pastor, you got to come up in the summer and, and you got to come and bless that island. I thought, man, I don't even know if I'd send, do you say then how do I bless an island? What do I do? Like, do I bless the sand? Do I walk around? I, I, like, you know. And you know what? I, I thought to myself, thank you for not telling me we were believing God for an island because I would have probably just said, you know, couldn't we go for like, you know, a little piece of real estate? And yet God has great plans and big plans. So don't think small. Don't think small. We have a great big God. Amen. If you're writing checks this, today, you write them out to Bramley Christian Fellowship. If you're not from there, don't worry. It's all, it's all good. We have great relationships. We're all going to take care of it all together. Uh, but because we're in this house and we appreciate Pastor Randy and, and uh, taking care of this, amen. Can we just honor Pastor Randy and opening his house to us? Debit, debit and credit is also available to you. And so in any way, God speaks to you. A service host, if you are ready right now, what I'm going to do is we're going to receive the offering. It is an offering. It's not a tithe. It's an offering. It's an over and above. Don't take it out of your tithe tomorrow. This is, this is something else now. Let's honor God. And I'm going to bless the food. We're going to have a, a great time of lunch and come back uh, for some more exciting prizes and then Pastor Warren is, is uh, going to be with us again. And uh, I, I, just, I just appreciate and want to thank each and every one of you for being here. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I release my faith with my brothers, Father. I release my faith and I, as they seed against their need. And as you speak Holy Spirit to them, you know the seed it will take to destroy and finish the need. And Father, I pray today, according to your word, I didn't write it, you wrote it, Lord. You inspired Paul to write it. I speak, oh God, a finishing faith. A finishing faith over these needs. Those that are in debt, maybe today, maybe there are, maybe there are loans and things that are outstanding. There is incredible pressure on these men wondering, where am I going to get this money? How am I going to supply that need? And we thank you, Lord, there is a principle, a supernatural principle that we release now. Even as Pastor Steve has been talking about fresh faith, Lord, we, we look at maybe our, our needs with fresh faith and say, God, you're going to finish it. You are the finisher today. We're not the finisher, but you are. So we thank you. We bless you. We love you, Father. We ask you to bless our food. Bless our fellowship. May relationships be ignited and birthed, oh God, in this, in this next uh, few moments as we gather together to break bread and, and just partake of the food and enjoy the fellowship in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen. 
Service host, ushers, if you will uh, come forward uh, right now. And uh, the worship team's going to lead us out. After the, the, the offering has been received, you can go right to the back. And is somebody... Sorry, guys, I didn't give him full instructions. We have two areas for eating. One's upstairs.